All right, we're back on the record on case CR 22, 21, 16, 23, State of Idaho versus Chad Guy Daybell. This is a hearing on defense counsel's motion to withdraw. The court conducted a closed portion of the proceedings to make further inquiry, and then in addition, conducted an ex parte proceeding without the state's presence to inquire of the defendant regarding counsel. And with that concluded now, the defense has presented their argument in support of the motion. So at this time, the court will consider the objection from the state, noting that uh, this was a shortened hearing. So the objection was filed yesterday, which I do find timely. I have read and considered the objection. And Ms. Blake, if you'd like to present argument in support of the objection, you can do that at this time. Thank you, Your Honor. First of all, the state recognizes that this is a decision that is solely within the court's discretion. I think Idaho criminal rule 44.1 clearly outlines that. It does indicate that a motion to withdraw can be granted, or excuse me, may be granted by a court for good cause. The state also recognizes that the Sixth Amendment guarantees a defendant the right to counsel. There have been case, there have been additional courts that have reviewed that and provided some additional interpretations, which includes a defendant's right to conflict-free counsel. The state is appreciative of the court conducting an inquiry today because case law also lays out that a trial court's failure to conduct an inquiry into any conflict may result in a reversal of a conviction down the road. Additionally, the onus is on an attorney seeking to withdraw to present sufficient facts to support the motion. I think from the state's perspective, we are a little confused today because we read the affidavit that was presented to the court. We, most of our motion was in response to that. The court has in fact done the inquiry and answered most of the questions the state had, also unsealing the order from the January proceeding where the defendant had referenced that Mr. Daybell was found indigent. We now have reviewed the transcript of that and that did answer some of the state's additional questions. One being that there was an actual finding of indigency. The reason that that's so important in this case is because the Idaho criminal rules outline if someone is charged with a capital offense and they're found to be indigent, um, I think the term they use is needy, but the equivalent, and they choose to hire counsel, they're allowed to do that. They can have private counsel of their choosing. However, if they opt to request the court appoint counsel, then there are certain requirements, and that includes having a capital qualified first chair attorney and a capital qualified second chair attorney to assist them in the proceedings. In addition to that, it flags some additional requirements that those defend the public defenders have to um, comply with and there are quite a few of them in that list that must be complied with but again if a defendant opts to have private counsel i think they do so knowing that their private counsel would not have to comply with those or at least their counsel should be advising them of that but they could also choose to forego having private counsel once they're found indigent in order to allow capital qualified attorneys to be appointed in the review of the proceedings from back in January, it appears that there was a request to have some additional counsel assist on the case, and that was made by Mr. Pryor with his client, Mr. Daybell, present. At that juncture, it looks like Mr. Pryor was advised that if he could find someone else to assist in the case, that there may be funds available to help pay for that second attorney. In later proceedings, it looks like the court revisited that issue when no other attorney made an appearance. And at some point in those proceedings, Mr. Daybell was asked and essentially waived his right to have capital qualified attorneys. He opted to stick with Mr. Pryor. What's frustrating for the state is back in January a year ago, both the defendant and Mr. Pryor were aware of the defendant's financial situation. They clearly presented it to the court for the finding of indigency. At that juncture, they also were well aware that there was no second chair helping on this matter. So here we are a year later, and for the first time, this issue is being brought up that, hey, I actually want to withdraw because I'm not going to get paid. 
I'd have to work 24 seven in order to be prepared for trial and still probably can't get everything done in time for trial. So we've got two issues within that motion. One, the not getting paid. And the second one, whether or not Mr. Pryor can be prepared for trial. The state tries to be cautious in interjecting ourselves too much when it comes to a defendant and their choice of counsel. However, I think the ethical rules and other rules mandate that prosecutors try to ensure that defendants have the right or are advised and actually have counsel representing them in proceedings. When we look at that requirement of the state, as well as some of the other factors the state has to consider, such as appellate issues, the state tries to be cognizant of those and do our best to avoid creating them. I think that's what the court has indicated here today. The real question is, at least for the state, the finances the state's staying out of, but the real question for the state is, can Mr. Pryor be effective at trial? The state doesn't want to redo a trial. We don't want to get through trial and then have an appellate issue that requires us to do that again. While the state is extremely frustrated that this is being filed so late, and we are frustrated for the citizens, we're frustrated for the victims in this case, if this motion is granted, the state fully recognizes it's going to cause a pretty significant delay. And now the victim's families have to wait that much longer. The state now has to absorb additional costs. It's frustrating. But in looking at the big picture, we also want to ensure that we don't have counsel that cannot be adequately prepared for trial. When I said the state was a little confused today, the reason for that confusion is I'm referencing what was said in the motion. What's been presented here in court today is very different. So we have conflicting statements from defense counsel at this point. The motion read as if counsel was indicating, I cannot be effective. If you make me stay on this case, I cannot be effective. The reason I say that is no person can work 24 seven on something. We all have to have time to sleep. We have to have time to do other things. So I know it's a phrase used a lot, but the reality is if working 24 seven, Mr. Pryor cannot be prepared for trial. What he's indicating is he would be ineffective at trial. What he's presented today is no, I can be effective. The motion says, I'm not gonna get paid. I want off the case. Today, what's being presented is no, I'm fine not getting paid. I'll stay on the case. So if Mr. Pryor's representations today are, I'm okay not getting paid and I can be effective, I don't actually know why we're here today. This doesn't appear to be a true motion to withdraw. The concern for the state is we've had multiple continuances in this case, and I recognize there can be arguments back and forth as to who did what and who caused the continuance. But at the end of the day, a year ago, Mr. Pryor was fighting very hard to get a continuance. He filed multiple motions to get a severance. He was finally successful with those in January or January, around January of last year. Maybe it was February, but he ended up getting both a severance and a continuance. Got a year long continuance. Again, last January, Mr. Daybell had been found indigent. They knew there wasn't a second chair. He's proceeded on the case for a year. He had the benefit of watching the co-defendant's trial. He knew exactly how long that trial was, knew, was able to observe and see how many witnesses there were, should have had a very good idea of what the trial preparation was going to require at that juncture. So again, very frustrated that we're getting here, but we had that, the request was, I need a continuance to test the DNA. We get past the trial, I'm actually not gonna test the DNA. The state recognizes that different tactical decisions can be made, but it was very frustrating that we ended up with a continuance and severance for something that never ended up getting tested. Now here we are again, a couple months, I think today is actually two months before we're supposed to start some trial proceedings, and we're hearing a motion, again, on a request to withdraw, where the representations today differ significantly from what was put in the affidavit and motion. So this does appear to be another attempt to simply get a continuance. So the, the state's position on this would be based on the representations today, it doesn't appear this is a motion to withdraw. And if Mr. Pryor's representations today are accurate, then I think the motion should be denied. The one question the state has that has not been answered directly to the state, and maybe the court has this information, is there were some conflicting things also represented about Mr. Daybell and, and his specific position on this. In the affidavit, it indicated he did not want Mr. Pryor to remain on the case that he wanted to have capital qualified attorneys appointed, that he didn't feel it was fair Mr. Pryor wasn't getting paid. Today, at least from the state's understanding, is we're hearing that Mr. Daybell does in fact want Mr. Pryor to get paid, so he wants him off the case. But then we're also hearing that Mr. Daybell would like Mr. Pryor to stay on the case. 
And I think that's really the important question today for the state is, does Mr. Daybell in fact want Mr. Pryor removed from the case? He's hired as private counsel. Is he in fact requesting Mr. Pryor be removed to have capital qualified counsel appointed? Because I think that's a different analysis and a different scenario than attorney than an attorney asking to be removed. So the state does not know the answer to that. I think we've- Ms. Blake, not to, uh, I wanna be careful because I had an ex parte proceeding, but in general terms, I think it's appropriate for me to advise the state that Mr. Daybell does desire to have Mr. Pryor continue in the case. And as you mentioned, is also very concerned and does not want him obligated to essentially work for free. So that's his overall position in general terms. And I think that's where we kind of um, run into an issue. While he may not want him to work for free, Mr. Pryor was hi hired privately. If a person has the resources to hire private counsel or if a private attorney decides to stay on pro bono, I think that's the counsel and the defendant's choice. I don't think there's any avenue to allow Mr. Pryor to be paid through another mechanism. I also don't think there's a mechanism that allows a public defender to be appointed to assist Mr. Pryor. I think under the statute, it's if you're indigent and you're asking for counsel, you get a first chair and a second chair qualified appointed. I don't think uh, under the statutes and the criminal rules, I don't see any hybrid system allowed. So I guess the state's concern is if that's the position of both the defendant and counsel, then we should simply be proceeding to trial and this motion should be denied. It's not a true motion to withdraw. If Mr. Pryor is saying I can't be prepared for trial in April, the state's very frustrated that this is clearly just a veiled motion to continue veiled, um, with a different title attached to it. Because that appears to be the true argument today is I need more time. So the state's very frustrated with that. Mr. Pryor's already had a year continuance. I guess from the state's perspective, if Mr. Pryor is going to stay on, we're headed to trial in April. The state's ready to move forward. If Mr. Pryor is saying I can't be effective at that point, then I think capital qualified counsel should be appointed and we should um, move forward with, the, with that counsel appointed and selecting a new trial date. But I don't think Mr. Pryor should be granted a continuance if that's really what's being sought today and that's what it truly sounds like is being requested. All right, thank you thank for you. the uh, argument and response. Mr. Judge, Blake. can I respond briefly? I was gonna allow your response, Mr. Pryor, so go ahead. Judge, I don't think I've been con inconsistent in my representations and my declaration and what was said today. Uh, this court took the time to inquire of Mr. Daybell and I believe what uh, Mr. Daybell related to the court uh, is consistent with what was put in the declaration. Uh, the reality of it is this, is that I disagree with uh, with counsel, and I don't know what she's reading or how she's interpreting a statute, but this court entered an order allowing uh, the assistance of a second counsel to help in the preparation of this case and did it some time ago. The reality, Judge, is that there, it's, although I've made a strong and diligent effort to find co-counsel to help me in this, it's, it's, it's been difficult and I haven't been able to accomplish that. And the reality is Mr. Daybell recognizes where we are in this thing and what, what needs to be done in the future. I don't have the benefit of Fremont and Madison County with their five attorneys in their prosecutor's office having free reign to do what they want at government expense. And the fact that the, both of those prosecutors then, in addition to their five, pro, five state attorneys, sought out an attorney from Missouri and at county expense and on the county dime brought an attorney to work on a case that wasn't a death penalty case for the taxpayers of Fremont and Madison County to pay for that attorney, even though it wasn't a death penalty case. And that attorney is still on and still going in this case. And they've expended a significant amount of money. And I suspect it's not at the hourly rate that a prosecuting attorney makes in Fremont and Madison County. I suspect it's significantly higher. And for me to suggest that it's difficult with their six attorneys that they're working on in this case, and I have to do this by myself, and the court recognized right, the workload. You've been on a case for two and a half years by yourself, and they have all these attorneys, and the state carries the burden at trial, and they can prosecute a case they want. Uh, I completely agree with the state's position. The timing here, two months before trial is going to start, none of this is new at all. The charges have not changed since the indictment. The co-defendant went through an entire trial, which you observed and knew how long it would take. We talked about this concern a year ago, and here we are on the doorstep of trial, essentially. And uh, the argument that is not persuasive at all to me is uh, you're just learning now how much work it's going to take. 
experienced attorneys, which you are, you figure out how long cases are going to take and you pick and choose the cases you decide to take as a private attorney. And this, this argument that uh, they have more attorneys than you, they do. That's, that's what they've elected to do. And you've also elected voluntarily, as has Mr. Daybell, to come on this case and represent him. And you've represented him since the beginning and in fact, even since before this case began. And Judge, the, the issue also is, is that I, I, per my representation earlier, is that in 2022, I started seeking out assistance and additional counsel. And I made a diligent effort. In fact, I took the extra step of seeking counsel who were death penalty qualified out of the state, out of state attorneys. I then tried to find attorneys on the public defender commission list and made a diligent effort. And then when I found one, I believe in October of last year, my expectation is that he would have been on this case by now. But then we come into late December and I'm finding out that he hasn't been approved or put on the list, even though the court authorized the funds and I'm in this position. As I've said before, Judge, uh, it's not a matter of being ineffective. And for the prosecutor to sort of hint at the fact that I've been ineffective, I would remind the prosecuting attorney that uh, uh, the fact is, is that I don't want to rehash this, but any continuance was the result of them not turning over a lot of evidence and a lot of evidence that I ended up having to go through and make a determination. Uh, so they can't put any continuance uh, on me when it was their own issue in terms of the discovery. Uh, the, other, the other issues, Judge, are simply this, is that in having made that effort to find these attorneys and, and, and help me with this case, I recognized that back in 2022. But being able to find someone is a whole different story. And the reality of it is this, is that uh, I'm not making differing statements from what I said today and what I put in that declaration. Uh, I've spent a lot of a portion of my life representing Mr. Daybell, and I would like to have continued that. But he sees the effort that needs to be uh, go, to go forward. And my expectation was in December or November of last year, I would have had an attorney on by now to assist me in this, and that hasn't taken place. And under our current law, and the way the law is written, and the way the court has interpreted the law, the only way for me to get another attorney, and to have Mr. Dable have the two attorneys that he wants, and what it was said in that declaration, and what is said today is still consistent. The only way to do that is for me to do, make the decision to step away from this thing. And to step away from this thing would guarantee and, and require Mr. Daybell to have two additional attorneys. Is it something I enjoy or want to do? No. Mr. Daybell knows full aware how I feel about this case and, 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 and how I wanted to be involved in this case. There has not been any differing uh, representations to this court. The problem is this, and, and I recognize, you know what, they get to gauge how many attorneys they want. They get to gauge the, the amount of money they spent. And in terms of getting uh, assistance for a defendant, I'm bound by the rules and the way the rules are wit written by our state legislature, and I'm bound by the statutes. And, and being bound by those statutes, I have no choice. If Mr. Daybell's going to, uh, you know, get the trial that he deserves, uh, either I find someone to help me, which I did starting in uh, with this court in January, but well before that, and it's to no avail, or I have to make the difficult choice. And I understand it's two months before this trial. I understand that. And it's not a choice I want to make. It's not a decision that I want, want to make in this case. But that overriding want for me to stay on this case, or that need for me to stay on this case, is overridden by the fact that Mr. Daybell should get uh, two attorneys to help him with this. I would have liked to have been one of those, but there's no mechanism to do that. So any suggestion that I've been ineffective is ridiculous. This case was severed. This case was transferred to Ada County, and Mr. Daybell would agree with me that I've done everything to strongly and effectively represent him in this case, and he is completely satisfied with what I've done. But there needs to be additional help. And unfortunately, under our current statutes, I don't get that if I remain on this case. And Your Honor, I just wanted to clarify one thing so we have a clear record. 
Go ahead. The state has in no way insinuated or represented that we believe Mr. Pryor has been ineffective. What we were referencing is based on the affidavit written to the court that we felt that was what was being indicated is if forced to proceed to trial, he would be ineffective because he simply didn't have adequate time to finish his preparations for trial. So I wanna make very clear, we are not saying Mr. Pryor was ineffective. Um, I want that very clear for the record. I, I understand that, Ms. Blake, and I, I agree the arguments have not been any ineffective assistance of counsel. The arguments have been related more towards uh, going forward in the demands of a two plus month trial and whether uh, given the concerns raised by the defense, a single attorney, that being Mr. Pryor, uh, would be capable of providing all of the defense necessary for Mr. Daybell in this case. So uh, that will conclude submission of argument on the motion. I'm going to take a brief recess, uh, review a few things, and then I'll come back on the record to make a ruling on your motion shortly. All right. All right, we've confirmed the live streams begun again. We are back on the record on case CR 2221 1623. The court has before it the defendant's counsel's motion to withdraw filed on January 11th. I've considered the motion along with the declaration in support of the motion. I've also considered the objection from the state. We conducted a hearing today where I heard argument from the Council, Mr. Pryor, in support of the motion, the objection by Ms. Blake from the state also conducted a closed portion of proceedings and an ex parte inquiry of Mr. Daybell and Mr. Pryor. And I've taken all that into consideration in determining the ruling on the motion. Uh, the court first is governed by Idaho Criminal Rule 44.1, which under paragraph A talks about leave to withdraw and I'll just quote that section, no attorney may withdraw as an attorney of record for any defendant in any criminal action without first obtaining leave and order of the court on notice to the prosecuting attorney and the defendant except as provided in this rule. Leave to withdraw as the attorney of record for a defendant may be granted by the court for good cause. So we've gone through the procedural steps to get here for this to be properly considered. The rule allows the court discretion where it indicates the court may allow for withdrawal and then looking at the standard of for good cause. So the court will first note uh, to clarify in this case, this is a capital case. Idaho does have a separate rule governing the appointment of attorneys who are on a roster that are considered qualified to represent counsel or represent defendants in capital cases. That's criminal rule 44.3. And importantly, that rule only applies when a defendant is represented by a public defender appointed by the court and does not apply when a private attorney is retained in the case. And also importantly, where the court made reference earlier to questions about uh, the mitigation phase, if that were to occur in this case under Idaho Code 19-2515, an inquiry to Mr. Pryor, and I'll note, and Mr. Pryor has correctly pointed out, that the ABA guidelines uh, do apply to public defenders. They are not necessarily required to be followed by private counsel. Private counsel under Idaho rules are allowed to take on a case capital case, and those guidelines may or may not be elected to be followed by a private attorney. Mr. Pryor clearly is a private attorney in this case, has never been appointed or publicly paid for representation of Mr. Daybell. Mr. Daybell importantly does have the right under the Sixth Amendment of the Constitution to counsel, and included in that right is to 
have the counsel of his choice. And Mr. Daybell elected a very long time ago to have Mr. Pryor represent him in this case. In fact, Mr. Pryor has agreed to take the case and has represented Mr. Daybell not only through the initial stages of the case here where the indictment was returned, but also in a previous companion case and for I think about three and a half years now has represented Mr. Daybell. The court then going back to consideration of the motion before the court. There's an issue here that's been raised by the state about the timing. And of course the court joins in that concern also. Uh, Mr. Daybell has been incarcerated since June 9th, 2020. We've got a trial scheduled in two months. Mr. Daybell's asserted his right to that trial. And although he has waived his right to a speedy trial, certainly this case has taken a long time to get to trial. And at some point, even with a waiver of speedy trial, the court has to consider the timeliness of a defendant in custody being granted their opportunity for a timely trial. That right also applies to the state and the state's right to seek justice for victims, to seek a conviction if they believe they have the evidence to do that and to not have to wait through unnecessary and unreasonable delays in bringing a case to trial. So the court has a duty to try to timely administer cases. And while the rules generally slow things down a lot, uh, there are reasons for that, but at some point the court has to consider the timing here. That's the big issue with this motion, quite frankly, is that the motion, if granted, would absolutely require a continuance of the trial and not just a brief continuance, because what would occur if I grant this motion and Mr. Pryor withdraws from the case, then under criminal rule 44.3, the court is required to appoint two capital qualified public defenders, absent Mr. Daybell having some manner of, again, rehiring a private new attorney or getting one to do it pro bono. The issue there is Idaho has a sparse number of attorneys on that roster and Idaho is currently experiencing a lot of cases that are already resulting in appointments of a lot of available attorneys. And quite frankly, I don't have any idea who would be appointed of the two. I don't have any idea when we could get them appointed. But what I do know is the trial would have to be vacated and would have to be continued. And I think uh, likely for a long time, maybe a year, maybe even more because for new counsel to come in, start over from scratch on a complex case like this, not have any uh, review of discovery or any preparation, they would have to reasonably request time to get prepared, which would have to be granted. Um, Mr. Pryor was raising concerns about trying to get second counsel appointed. And I've tried to accommodate that, Mr. Pryor. We had a hearing, it was, exactly a year ago on January 19th of 2023 and talked about your concern. The way I interpreted rule 44.3, while it doesn't really address a situation with a private attorney together with a public defender, I don't think the rule necessarily prohibits that either. And so I approved that you could have co-counsel if you could find someone, but of course, it would have to be on that approved roster because this is a capital case. I don't doubt that you've made a diligent effort to try to find co-counsel. That's clear to the court. I know uh, we've addressed that over the course of the last year on numerous occasions, the status of whether or not someone was coming into the case. We're on the eve of trial and no one has come into the case. Uh, with that in mind then, the court has to also look at uh, the impact that could potentially have if Mr. Pryor withdraws from the case, Mr. Daybell's required to start over, abandon an attorney-client relationship that's been ongoing for several years, start over with a brand new attorney-client relationship with someone that he doesn't know and we can't even tell him who that would be. 
And also with the delay, I find that that prejudices the defendant. I also would find that given all of the preparation and time that has gone into this trial setting, which has been scheduled out for a long time, uh, made by both the court and obviously the state in being prepared and ready to go, that there should be a presumption that we maintain the trial date. So the two concerns here raised in the motion really are number one, the fact that Mr. Pryor would not be able to obtain payment for his services. And the court does strongly consider that because uh, attorneys work for their profession and it's important that they get paid and it's a consideration But that in and of itself does not, in my mind, rise to the level of good cause under the rule 44.1 to grant the withdrawal. The second and I think more concerning issue is some indication in the motion of Mr. Pryor indicating that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, to be adequately prepared for trial. That's what's set forth in the motion. However, upon argument here today also, Mr. Pryor has indicated that he has made steps. I don't find anything in the record that he's been ineffective in his uh, assistance of Mr. Daybell's defense in the case. And so uh, with the concerns today being brought up and addressed directly by the court, both in open and closed proceedings, I don't find any specific grounds indicating that Mr. Pryor has said he cannot and would not be ready and prepared to adequately defend his client. Although it may be difficult and he apparently will not be able to be compensated, uh, it's not in the record that it can't be done. And importantly also, Mr. Daybell has affirmed today, he does intend and would like to keep Mr. Pryor as his attorney in this case. And finally, I'll note that in addressing these concerns at that hearing a year ago, uh, there was a representation by Mr. Pryor who said directly to this court, and I'll quote what was said in the hearing, quote, there's going to be no continuance because I'm asking to get out of this case. That will not happen. And the courts relied all along on those representations in getting this case scheduled. So in balancing all that out, and looking at whether or not good cause has been demonstrated today, I do not find that there is good cause for withdrawal of counsel. And so under criminal rule 44.1, upon consideration of that standard, the court is going to deny your motion to withdraw Mr. Pryor. I will note that I've previously made an approval for a second chair. If one can and will join the case, then the court will permit that and we'll go through uh, the procedure to get that properly done. So that's not a foregone conclusion. Given the timeliness of the trial, I understand that may be difficult. However, uh, we are where we are with this trial setting and because of the proximity of trial and the necessity of a continuance, if this motion were granted, uh, the court finds that the motion fails to demonstrate good cause under the rule. For that reason, the motion's going to be denied. And Mr. Pryor, uh, you will continue to represent Mr. Daybell through these proceedings. That'll be the ruling on the motion today. And I'll note that we do have uh, more hearings scheduled and coming up, including motions and a pretrial conference. So Mr. Pryor, do you have any questions on my ruling? No, Judge, thank you for your consideration. All right, thank you. Uh, Ms. Blake, any questions on the court's ruling? All right, thanks everyone for your attendance. That will conclude today's proceedings. We'll be in recess. All right. You want to talk about the agreements or anything?